of the greatest gifts that Jesus gave us is the Holy Spirit. You know, the disciples were with Jesus for three and a half years, and he dies. He raises from the dead. Hundreds of people see him after he raises from, you know, he rises from the dead. And then he says to them, I'm going to go, but before I, but, but, but I need to go, but I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you what you need. And we as Christians, we all have the same commission. We go into all the world and make a Jesus-sized difference. We make disciples that begins with evangelism and all the way through. But Jesus said that we didn't just need truth and we didn't just need doctrine and we didn't just need the right beliefs, that we needed a relationship with him, with God. We needed a, a person. We cannot be left alone. And so he sent us the Holy Spirit. And the message and where we're going to go today, here's all that I know, is that your love for someone trumps your opinion about something. That the world is aching for a church to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, not just on Sundays, but a personal relationship in the good moments and in the tough moments, in the moments where conversations get difficult, that we don't just resort to our family of origin behavior, that we are actually bought and by the blood of Jesus into a new family and we begin to engage differently or in a counter-cultural way. I think about Pentecost Sunday and I think about how Jesus actually said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. And so what was just Jewish is going to include grafted in Gentiles. What was just happening in Jerusalem is going to go worldwide. And on Acts 2, we see that the Holy Spirit is poured out on women and men young and mature, so much so that they bring the scripture of Droll saying, this is that, which was prophesied. It is this heart that it's not just reserved for this group or that group, but the body of Christ together all around the world making a Jesus-sized difference. But all of it comes from the pretext of this, that the 120 who were in the upper room What did they just experience 50 days earlier? They experienced what you experience in life. I'm not sure if you've ever had a dream that's dashed. I'm not sure that you've ever not woken up on a day and received news. I'm not sure if you've ever gone through something. I imagine all of us had. But they had just watched the one that they put all of their faith in die. And not only die... For three days, they, 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 he not only dies, but think about Peter, the man who preaches on Pentecost. He gets up and he preaches this beautiful sermon in Acts chapter 2, but he knows the bitterness of his own failure. And he knows in that moment that Jesus didn't discard him, that he pulls him in. And then from that space of seeing Jesus not only die, but raise from the dead. How many of you know that the one who rose from the dead, you pay attention differently to what they said after? You really do. Like, there are some people, hey man, the world is full of opinions. But then there are people who've walked through stuff that you listen to them differently. Like, I remember when I was young. I remember it. And I remember having parenting ideas when I didn't have any kids. <laughs> and parents who'd gone through some things were like, they're there, they're there. <laughs> Not in a condescending way, just in a, you'll see, you'll see. That's a wonderful theory. And then life is going to punch you right in the face. And your theory, but then you see people who've walked through stuff. Well, the 120 in the upper room, church, they walk through some stuff. And if there's one thing that we need a baptism of today is not a baptism of opinions. We need a baptism of the love of God. Because we are in, there, there is no map for what it looks like moving forward. But we don't need one because we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit who is God and knows all things. See, counter, living countercultural, which is what we're talking about today, Living a countercultural mission is each Christ follower serving as a faithful presence by trusting in God's power and living differently from cultural norms. I'm reminded to encourage some of you about your faith. You know, Dr. Timothy Keller once said, I want you to imagine that you are walking through the parted Red Sea 
and on one side of you is a wall of water, on the other side of you is a wall of water. And some of you are just so confident that you would strut through it. It's just who you are. You're amazing. You really are. Like you would walk through on dry ground like, look at what my God did. Look at what my God did. And you'd be full of confidence. And then there's others of you who would walk fearful every single step going, that's coming down. That's coming down. That's coming down. Just my luck. Just my luck. Just my, right? Come on. And you're awesome too. Okay? We, we don't always want to hear your opinion, but you're awesome. You're amazing. It is not the size of their faith that is the source of whom they place their faith in. Whether they walk through confidently or trepidatious, how many of you know that it is the God who withheld the waters who deserves glory, and it is the faith in him that matters? And so for me and for you, it is the same, same thing. There is never a person who God does not love precisely as he loves you. And everyone said, anybody in your life that you don't love very much? God loves them as much as he loves you. Anybody near here, when you look at like how they vote, you passionately disagree with them? God loves them as much as he loves you. There's not a person that you will ever lay eyes on that God does not love the way he loves you. And secondly, there are no people who do not have eternal destinations. I believe God is more loving than we can possibly imagine. But I equally believe that God is more holy than we can really comprehend. And these two things are equally true. And so when it comes to the space of eternity, why did I just kind of share everything I did at the beginning? Because the pretext is really important to Acts chapter 2. Because I want to see the whole chapter. Like not just, not just the infilling. What pushes Peter and the 120 out of the upper room with this message of which many of them will lose their life for, by the way? But they do it with confidence and boldness. It is, again, because the one who conquered death said things about earth and eternity that were now stamped into their eyes, and they couldn't see the world the same way anymore because everybody in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, outside of a relationship with Jesus, had an eternal destiny that is different than God's design. And there was something that hit their heart in a profound way that pushed them out of their comfort zones, full of not opinions and powers of this world, but the power of the Holy Spirit, it did not keep them contained. It pushed them out into a lost and broken world. And we, as his church, need that same infilling day after day after day to be pushed out into a lost and broken world. Oftentimes I hear something like this, that there is no way after seeing God, people would still reject God. And the question that I would ask this morning is, is that true? That there's no way after people see God that they would reject God. And the question is, is it true? An insightful reply in The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. And without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Man, this morning, like you, I walked out of my front door. And I looked at my neighborhood, which is like a circle. And the prayer that I pray when I walk out my front door is, Lord, give me a love for my neighbors that oftentimes I just don't have. Lord, give me a love for them and a love that pushes me out of my comfort zone. A love that sees not only earth but eternity. A love that has a relationship with the Holy Spirit that's not like a, it's not this downer what I am not doing. It is this infilling, rising up of, man, this is what I could do through your life. 
You know, Jesus told a profoundly sobering story, a fictional story on earth to reveal truth regarding eternity. And we want to use this test as a litmus for our question today. Is it really true that that there is no way after seeing God that people would still reject God? And from the perspective of Jesus, is this truthful? And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 16, and it's a lengthy text. But it actually starts, you know, when, by the way, when Jesus gave this, there was no chapters and verses. He just talked. And so it really starts in Luke 15. And Luke Luke chapter 15 actually starts with the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And it tells about the heart that which Jesus would go to actually seek and save every single one of us and his desire for every single one in the city. This is what Jesus would do. And Luke chapter 15, that gets to Luke chapter 16. And once again, the man who said this is the one who died and rose from the dead. The man who said this about earth and eternity and not just earth is the one who said to the disciples, I need you to go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but not in the power of hatred against Rome. You need to be filled with a different power, the power of the Spirit, because if you go in the power of I don't like Rome, you are not a countercultural story. It is the same story again and again and again. It is what we're against. It is not who we are for. So you need to be filled with a power and a spirit that is different from and altogether separate from the powers of this world. You need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not just like a a drip into your life. He's going to fill you from your toes right the way out until you got fire shooting out your head. That's how full you are. That was a joke, by the way. It was a classic Pentecostal Sunday joke. Luke 16 There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man, Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Pause. You should have other parables if you know parables going off in your head as we read this one. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And then it says, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. We'll explain that really briefly in a second. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And this is what Jesus says. And besides all of this, in other words, besides everything that I just said, between us and you, everyone say us and you, there is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have the prophets, Or they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, 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 no. Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, this is now Jesus being prophetic. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So again, the question from Jesus' perspective is, is it true that there is no way after really seeing God that people would still reject God? All people, unless Christ returns and we have faith in him, will taste death. This is a lovely, by the way, Pentecost Sunday morning. All of us will. Being a pastor now for 25 years, yeah, this is one of my last Sundays that I can say I'm in my 40s. Some of you are like, oh, you're still so young. And others of you are like, you're really old. 
however you see me, the answer is yes. <laughs> when I do funerals, I've been doing them for 25 years. I hear every version of this can't be true. I did a funeral this week. Every funeral. I take a deep breath. I share the gospel. And whether I go to my office or my car, from my toes, I weep every time. Because unless the spirit moves, people are not not listening. They're deaf. They don't hear it. And so it is this ache and this prayer to say, Holy Spirit, would you do what we cannot do? Has anyone here ever been trying to talk to someone who is going through something in life and you can't get through? You need God to do what only God can do. And here's what I know about that space. You feel so powerless. Loved ones, embrace it. It is the doorway to a relationship with the Spirit. When you can't do anything, this is what the invitation from God feels like to go then, oh, that was loud. <laughs> Trust me. Engage with me. Now, I want you to see in the text that we just read some things that are important. Number one is that Hades is the place of the wicked, the dead. Abraham's side is just an expression that Jesus was using, the fellowship of believers already in heaven. And he said that there was a fixed chasm that none could cross back and forth. But I also want you to notice that Lazarus, who was a rich man, behaves in eternity identically to how he did in earth. He has been rich and served his whole life and so in eternity, what does he say about Lazarus? He asks God to send the person who he saw like at his door where the dogs were licking. He sees him the same way. He's the same person consumed with self. Send Lazarus. Send that beggar. He's, it's not as though he sees God and then, man, he's a different person. He sees God and he is identically unchanged. He's the same person. It is a choosing, a rejecting. It is a love of self over a love of God. And that is very, very intoxicating to our culture today. Lazarus has his five brothers and he says, warn them. Abraham replies that they will need to hear and respond to God, that the message is everywhere, that Moses and the prophets, it's, 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 it's everywhere. It's right there. It's right there. They just, how many of you know that God does not make it difficult for us to come to relationship with him? When it comes to having a relationship with God, he didn't go 99. He went 100%. He even said it. It is finished. What does that mean? You can't add onto the plow of salvation. It is done. All you have to do is receive. And your receiving isn't even works. It's just faith and trust. It's all it is. Every single person that you see today who does not yet follow and know Jesus is loved by Jesus. But every single person that you see today also has an eternal destiny on, his li on their lives. And it's not meant, again, to be a downer. It is meant to be able to say, this is the mission that whatever you do for your job title is secondary to what it is that Jesus has called you to do. It is who he has called you to be. And I'm not saying your job title is insignificant. I'm just saying it's wood, hay, and stubble compared to the riches of the kingdom of God. The rich man replied, replies that they will repent if someone goes to them from the dead. It's the equivalent that we've been talking about. There's no way after seeing God that people would still 
reject God. And how does Jesus respond to the statement? We've read it. I'm going to read it again. Luke 16, 31. He said to them, if they do not hear the prophets and Moses, I want you to hear it. This is Luke 15. We've talked about Acts 2. What is in between Luke 15 and Acts 2 is the cross. And here's what Jesus says. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should raise from the dead. The guy who's telling the story is going to rise from the dead. And people are still going to go, don't believe it. And we as the church, we are not slick enough. We are not good enough. We are not talented enough and we don't want to be. There is nothing that we can do to make somebody who is blind see, deaf hear, not in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense. Church, we don't need a just head knowledge of the Holy, a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. And here is why. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who will Give the gift to them if their heart is open like he has given it to you. Because there's not a person that you will ever lay eyes on that God does not love as much as he loves you. For us, I am terribly afraid also too that the idea of hell often becomes an indictment upon the character of God. How can a loving God send people to hell? I'm often asked that question as well, which stops with, let's just go back. Why do you believe that a loving God sends people to hell? Is that even true? You're stating the question like it's absolute truth and then asking someone else like a Christian to rebut it. Or again, is it more that God is love and God who is love, it won't be self-seeking and he will let you continue in the arc of your own salvation, whether in yourself or something inferior or him. And Jesus said, I am the way. You know what a way is? It's a direction. It's a way in which your life goes. And it doesn't have to go. How many of you, the moment you said yes to follow Jesus, to go in this direction, everything went perfect from that moment on? No. You're on a narrow road. You ain't on a tightrope. Aren't you glad for grace? The same grace that saved you is the same grace you need every single day. And it is this relationship with the Holy Spirit that you and I need. Last last week, Pastor Mitch, I listened to the message. So good, by the way. Better than what I'm doing right now, but so good. Speaking about Moses, how many of you recall the story of Moses? If you're new to church, I'll just fill you in. There's this book in the Old Testament called Exodus, and in it is there's an individual, a character named Moses. And Moses, um, he is born Hebrew, and then he, become, he grows up in the house of Pharaoh, so Egypt. So he's got a really confused identity for a season. All right, uh, loved ones, God works passionately. in a culture who have confused identities. May we be a church that loves people well. Anyhow, so God works in Moses' life, and he's Hebrew, but he's grown up Egyptian, and he's confused. And one day he sees a, as Pastor Mitch preached so brilliantly, he, he, he sees an, an Egyptian brutalizing a Hebrew, and it, uh, he reacts out of an inferior power. And so Moses kills the Egyptian. And you can see things in culture that are wrong, but you can still have the wrong spirit and how to address them. And this is what happens to Moses. And so God takes Moses, and he puts him in this desert of Midian, and he introduces himself to who he is. And in introducing himself to who he is, he puts him on the mission to not be one who takes life but gives life to millions of his people and see them come out of slavery. And as we do, there's this thing called the Ten Commandments. How many of you remember those? Did you know, again, that each of the Ten Commandments were against Egyptian gods? And so the entire story 
it is saying, this is God saying to all of Israel and Egypt, there is a God that is greater than Pharaoh. There is a God that is greater than Pharaoh. There is a God that is greater than Pharaoh. And I promise you the story of Christianity today is that there is a God that is greater than sexuality. There is a God that is greater than success. There is a God that is greater than religion. There is a God that is greater. It is this invitation to know God and to be formed by God and to walk in the way of Jesus. And here's what I promise you. If you and I truly walk in the way of Jesus, it will be be uncomfortable. It will lead you to say and to be in places where you're like, I don't want to be here. Some of you are like, that's me right now. That was a joke. <laughs> Not funny if true. Man, I think about when Jesus is telling this story in his day. And I think about the people who are blind that he heals. Or I think about the woman with the issue of blood who pursues. And I think about a guy like Zacchaeus who's rich. And he has one lunch with Jesus. And everything changes and then I think about the rich young ruler who's just like Zacchaeus, man, just as rich. He has the same encounter with Jesus and he just walks away. Yet the faithful presence of Jesus is the one who is there in each situation. Loved ones, your mission is not to convince, it is to remind people that there is a God who loves them. It is to be a faithful presence when everything in you wants to run, when everything in you's had enough. And if you and I don't have a real relationship with the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves being tempted to go to different, quicker powers that get inferior results that may get change but not transformation. Oh, as a parent, I can change my kids' plans. If they're in my house at 23, I can still change their plans. I'm not saying I'm being a bad parent. I'm just saying I can change their plans. I can touch their heart, but I'm powerless to transform it. And sometimes I get that confused. Sometimes Lori and I are lying in bed and we're complaining about it. Pause. I'm complaining. I have the spiritual <laughs> gift of complaining. <laughs> Lori has the spiritual discipline of perseverance. I don't know if this will ring true for some of you. Sometimes I would rather complain than pray. Because when I pray, I know God's going to ask me to do something. <laughs> the longer I live and the longer I lead, it is not with wise and persuasive words. Paul said it is a demonstration of the spirit and power. We don't need a cliche Pentecost Sunday. We need a deep, abiding, repentive humility to be able to say, Holy Spirit, come. Do what only you can do. Awaken my heart with hope. Awaken my heart with vision. Help me to see that you love that liberal as much as you do the conservative. I don't know about the NDP, but help me. That was a joke. That was 100% a joke. You love, God, help us to see that this is an inferior power to what it is that you want to do. Help us not get seduced into these things that are not ultimate things. Help us, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you come? Okay. 
So is it true that there is no way after seeing God that people would still reject God? The answer from Jesus' perspective is no, that's, that's not true. But here's what is abundantly true. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Turn the person inside you and go, feels like it sometimes. No, he's not. He is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness. Here's what it says God is towards us. He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that each should we reach repentance. What is repentance? It is simply that I trusted this way, and now I just go in the way of Jesus. I am following in the direction, Jesus, I trust you for earthly things, yeah, but I also trust you about eternal things. This is what it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have what? If eternal life. You and I in the land of the living are called to this countercultural mission, which means that we got one foot, one eye, and one ear in earth. And we got this other eye, this other ear, and this other foot in eternity. And we live for, the, for a different king who is seeking to establish a different kingdom on earth, the one that we most desire to live in. You and I, in the land of the living, are called to live a countercultural mission. And so let me just end here. Countercultural mission is each Christ follower, that means you, serving as a faithful presence. Pause. God is not going to ask you to fulfill somebody else's mission but he is going to ask you to complete the task he's assigned to you. Well, how do I know what the task is he's assigned to me? What has he given you to steward? What's in your hands right now? And it changes all throughout our lives. Sometimes it increases. Sometimes it decreases. But we are a faithful presence by trusting in God's power, not any other power, and then living differently from cultural norms. Loved ones, each and every one of you, each and every one of you is called to Christian service. Not Pastor Mitch, Sarah, Sam, Karen. Well, they're the pastors. I know. Every one of us is called to Christian service. Every one of you is called to ministry leadership. You know the first person you're called to lead? You. And you're the hardest one. The hardest one you'll ever lead is not sitting in a seat. If you're leading a meeting or anything, the hardest one was you, the face you saw in the mirror. It's the hardest one to lead. Because, how, because you leading you is not good. Me leading me, not good. Being a Christian leader is all about letting the Holy Spirit lead me. And every single day, every day, that stupid Carrie Underwood song, Jesus, take the wheel. I hear it in my head every day. Every day I have a fight with the Holy Spirit of who gets the wheel. It takes my kids to say one thing, and I got the wheel. It takes Lori one glance, and I've got the darn wheel. It takes one thing not to go right, and I've got the wheel. And each and every one of you have been given a ministry assignment or position. In a lost and broken world, on this Pentecost Sunday... Will you respond to the call of Christian service? With open hands, will you allow the Holy Spirit to love, oh yeah, and lead you? But will you also say yes to allowing him to root you in a power that is different, perhaps, than the power that you most desire? 
can you live and enjoy the world that God created while having a heart that is homesick for a heaven which is not the one we live in? Holy Spirit, in this moment, where we talk about weighty things like heaven and hell, earth and eternity, where we absolutely nail it and where we fall short. Where life goes according to plan and when life goes nothing like the plan. Lord, I thank you. We fight our battles different. Lord, I thank you that every song that we sang actually told the message that we were going to deliver. Every one. That this is my testimony. And for the Canada campus, Holy Spirit, keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. We want you to know we're not satisfied with this. We are never dissatisfied with you, but we are not satisfied with this level of your presence. We want more. We're hungry for more. Father, we want you to interrupt services. Father, we, we're not slick enough to do this, and we don't want to be. We do not know how to change this city, but we know that you do, Holy Spirit. We do not know how to cause our loved ones to come back to you, but Holy Spirit, you do. We do not know how to push back darkness in a sense, but the Holy Spirit, you do. And so Jesus, we thank you, not as Pentecostals, but as your kids, that you didn't leave us as orphans, that you left us with not a religion, that you left us with you, the person, God, of the Holy Spirit in our midst, and Holy Spirit, forgive us for speaking about you like a force and not a friend. Forgive us for treating you just indifferently. Holy Spirit, we are sorry. We repent. We don't just welcome you. We need you. And we say unashamed. If you do not come, we do not want to go. One step further, Holy Spirit, where your presence isn't, even if it's a land of promise, even if we get the job and the wife and the career, if it's not with you, it's not a big enough dream. Your presence trumps all those things. Oh, Father, teach us what it really means to have a relationship with you in this most loving, hope-filled Jesus size difference way. In your name we pray. Amen.